For our last lesson in this three-part series, we will examine the theologies of Bart and the Apostle Paul to learn more about their unique beliefs and how those beliefs contributed to our own understanding of Jesus Christ. One commonality between Paul and Bart is that they both attempted to shift the focus away from human-centered theologies, like the political nature of the Pharisees and Roman emperors, or the nationalistic manipulation of religion by the Nazi party, that found answers in our own logic, reason, or leaders, and towards a return to divine scripture and revelation that must be constantly consulted and never fully understood as we pursue a more perfect life in Christ. If anything, our human loyalties and leaders need to be held up to the higher standard of Jesus' perfect life, our own divine revelation of God in human form. As Karl Barth once wrote, Jesus does not give recipes that show the way to God as other teachers of religion do. He is himself the way. The dialectical method. God is not simply man writ large. Man cannot capture the truth about the eternal God in his own finite formulas. Man can only witness to the paradoxicality of God's own self-revelation. James C. Livingston, Modern Christian Thought. The notes I'm using on Karl Barth come from James Livingston's excellent book, Modern Christian Thought, which details the theological contributions of many of our modern Christian thinkers and writers. This method, the dialectical method, is based on the challenges we have as mortal humans living in a finite space with a limited understanding of our own world and existence at best. How on earth are we to know God, who lives in an unknowable infinite space and sees beyond our understanding at every turn? Historically, spiritual leaders in different faiths have turned to two different approaches to understand God, dogmatism and mysticism. Dogmatism represents, with a kind of literal certainty, everything you need to know about God and faith. You just need to learn it and apply it as presented. It is one right way that is knowable. Mysticism asserts that God is transcendent, but that we can reach a better understanding of him through certain spiritual practices that open our minds to the unknowable. Whirling dervishes, meditation, even walking the Christian labyrinth. Typically, mystics will rely on a guru who teaches them how to achieve nirvana with God through these practices, and dogmatics will present written or oral principles that need to be learned and followed. Bart wrote about a third method that he claimed came from the Apostle Paul and was a more accurate way of understanding God, the dialectical method. This method understands that we cannot fully understand the truth of God using our own finite formulas based on our limited understanding of the world. Instead, we can only seek out and acknowledge the paradoxes of a God responsible for creation and revelation while also intentionally hiding or obfuscating some truths as beyond our understanding. In other words, God is beyond our world but has revealed parts of himself within it that must be understood as parts of an unknowable and at time paradoxical whole. Can you think of examples in which God purposefully reveals himself in part or shows himself while still being not fully understood? God as Holy Other For Barth, the first task of theology is to emphasize the infinite distance between God and man, with God only being known by God, by his revelation in Jesus Christ. The knowledge of God in Jesus Christ and God's hiddenness are paradoxically one and the same. James C. Livingston, Modern Christian Thought. This idea of a dialectical method is needed because Bart also describes God as holy other, an idea we may understand intellectually, but not always emotionally. Bart claims that our first task in theology is to emphasize the distance between God and man. Even his unveiling of himself through Jesus Christ and scriptural revelation is purposefully meant to highlight the ways we cannot fully understand him. There is a reason Jesus speaks in parables and constantly tells his followers they have ears but cannot hear or eyes and cannot see. These help us approach an understanding of God that will always be just beyond our grasp. And that's a good thing, because too much human certainty about God and his purpose generally is used by false prophets to manipulate us. Approaching God as wholly other and beyond our understanding should help us maintain our own humility in approaching God and faith. It can also help us to come to terms with contradictory notions in the Bible, like grace versus judgment or faith versus works. How do you think of God as wholly other, and how could that help you on your own faith journey? 
the strange world of the Bible. We prefer to go to the Bible with our own presuppositions, our own worldview, which we then read out of the Bible as its own. It is not the right human thoughts about God which form the content of the Bible, but the right divine thoughts about men. James C. Livingston, Modern Christian Thought. Just as God is wholly other, so is scripture meant to be taken as strange rather than familiar, inspired by God about men rather than men about God. Many times we go to the Bible looking for one thing and find another. You may go looking for practical advice or examples of moral excellence and find only confusing stories and adages that must be puzzled out and extreme examples of imperfect humans. Bart believed that the Bible was not meant to have practical value, but a much larger purpose as witness to the other, new, greater world, because it is in this world, but about God who is not of this world. The Bible should take us beyond a mirror reflecting us and toward the world of God that lives beyond us. The challenge is that, as Bart writes, the Bible is also a human document, like any other written by biblical witnesses, to God and Jesus, witnesses who themselves were fallible men with historical and scientific judgments that were often wrong. This was a theme that was consistent with the neo-orthodoxy movement that Bart helped found. Liberal theology looked for universally noble and sublime truths within the Bible. Bart believed that the Bible becomes God's word when we go to it in the right way, opening ourselves up to understanding God through it while also recognizing it as a strange text written by men about experiences with God. In Opposition of Natural Theology Bart holds that there is no point of contact between revelation and man's natural experience and knowledge. Natural theology presupposes an analogy of being between God and man, and that man can gain some knowledge of God apart from God's special revelation by simply being man, an idea Bart opposed, James C. Livingston, Modern Christian Thought. Bart criticized natural theology as another approach that did not fully appreciate God's otherness. Natural theology was a movement that supposed an analogy between God and man, created in his own image. We must retain parts of God within us and within the world he created, and can thereby understand God by better understanding our own nature. In this respect, Bart was hard on humanity claiming that we don't really want to know the true nature of God because our sinful nature has estranged us from him. Not recognizing that estrangement prevents us from fully accepting the grace of God over our broken selves and broken world, a grace that is needed for all people falling short of God. Bart thought that practitioners of natural theology were more likely to imagine they can know God and therefore justify and sanctify themselves by their own efforts, a theology that Bart finds exists in most religions. How might religion attempt to circumvent God in imagining it knows God and can justify and sanctify humans through certain efforts? Why might that be a bad thing? Now we'll turn to the Apostle Paul. Faith, not works. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now we'll dial back the clock to understand the major theological beliefs of the Apostle Paul, who introduces yet another perspective on the Hebrew scriptures with his theology of faith versus works. Paul states that through Christ we are saved through grace alone, not through doing good works. He contrasts Christianity's emphasis on the grace of God and the faith of the believer with the Jewish insistence on the law as the necessary means for salvation. How about this idea of faith versus works go along with what we have heard so far from Bart's theology? The body of Christ. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. 
The Apostle Paul is very well known for his analogy of the church as the body with Christ as the head and all of us as different parts within that unified body, baptized by one spirit into one body, no matter our upbringings or backgrounds. Why do you think this might be an important distinction to make? And how might it also have resonated with Bart's view of Christianity in the 20th century? The Messianic Age. Paul writes in his first letter to the Thessalonians, According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. One great motivator for Paul that highlights the strangeness of the Bible that Bart describes is his belief that he is living in a messianic age. In other words, Paul believed in something like the rapture occurring within his lifetime. That's one of the reasons he didn't want you to get married or divide your loyalties. The time is nigh. Why do you think Paul believed in the imminent return of Christ? How did that view impact the leaders of the early church? And what good or bad can come from such messianic views? Here's some further discussion questions on today's lesson. What challenges do we have in discerning God and his will, given the limitations of our human minds? In what ways do you think God has revealed himself to humans and why? Have you ever found yourself reading the Bible in a way that supports what you already believe? When, if ever, have you let yourself be challenged by the scriptures to think differently than you are inclined? Do you think we can gain knowledge of God simply by being created in his image? Why or why not? Why was it important for Paul to insist that we are saved through grace alone, especially when so many good works were needed in the early church? How do you understand Paul's analogy of Christians as making up a body with Christ as its head? In what ways did Paul's certainty of Christ's return during his own lifetime influence his ministry? I hope that you've enjoyed this three-week series on Carl Bart and the Apostle Paul. We will begin a regular Sunday school class on Sunday mornings at 945 at Port Orange Presbyterian Church starting this coming Sunday, June the 25th um, at 945 in the Gathering Place. We will be reading Carl Bart's The Epistle to the Romans. Thank you.